Hi, this is Brandon Butler, and this is Licensing Session 8, Beyond the Terms of the License. So far, you've learned how licenses work as contracts, and you've seen some different kinds of licenses you may encounter in the wild. You know that if you're accessing content subject to a license agreement, the terms of that license may affect your ability to do TDM research, even though copyright itself is TDM friendly thanks to fair use. Now we're going to look at some of the legal questions you can ask about a license other than what's in it. These questions include, am I bound? How does this license affect fair use? What happens if I breach? What on earth is trespass to chattels? And finally, how can I manage risk? The word for someone bound by a contract is privity. If you're in privity with the uh, others in the contract, then you are bound by it. If not, then not. How do you know if you're in privity? As you learned at the beginning of this series, a contract requires both offer and acceptance. And to accept a contract, you need adequate notice of its terms. If a contract mechanism fails, you won't be in privity. With non-negotiable contracts, especially online and digital ones, there's still substantial controversy about when and how these agreements actually bind users. Some browse wrap licenses have been ruled unenforceable in court because users didn't have adequate notice of the terms or an opportunity affirmatively to accept them. Other contexts where a user may not be bound by a contract include downstream users of resources subject to a license. Consider a secondhand user who obtains data not directly from the publisher, but through a colleague or intermediary. It seems unlikely that someone in that scenario can be bound by terms they never saw and never had any opportunity to accept. Similarly, someone who acquires content on the secondhand market, used software or other media, for example, may never be presented with adequate opportunity to accept the relevant terms. In my experience, some people who work with licensed materials, including lawyers, unfortunately, have come to believe that the license is all that matters when it comes to figuring out whether and how licensed collections can be used. A license is private law, that the parties make for themselves after all, and the parties can and often do agree to abridge the default legal rights they bring to the table as part of the bargain. If a contract is a legally enforceable promise, then it's easy to see how someone could promise not to exercise fair use. But depending on the contract, you might not have made that promise, in which case fair use will survive. Instead of thinking of contract as necessarily nullifying fair use, you should imagine contract law and fair use rights as separate sources of authority. You can seek permission, a license, to use a covered work, or you can exercise your own rights under the law. If the copyright holder withholds permission, that doesn't necessarily undermine fair use. Indeed, it had better not, because fair use just is the right to make certain uses without permission. Whether fair use survives a license will depend on the specifics of the contract. Here are some common types of provisions that can occur in license agreements and their likely effects on fair use. As you can see, far from always nullifying fair use, there are many circumstances in which fair use survives a license. Language of clear prohibition or a promise not to engage in certain uses is most likely sufficient to surrender fair use rights. An example of clearly prohibitory language is user agrees not to or user shall not. This is a promise by the user not to exercise her fair use rights. Licensors commonly use this kind of language to ensure users don't engage in bulk downloading, for example, or redistribution. A statement that a particular license is for XYZ use only, for example, for personal use only, should be read to leave fair use intact. That language tells you how far the license goes, but it does not tell you that you may not rely on fair use to go further. It may be that the licensor would be unpleasantly surprised by uses that exceed the license, and you may factor that into your risk calculus. However, fair use is by definition a use that the rights holder cannot control simply by withholding their consent. Contractual silence about a particular fair use activity should also generally leave fair use rights intact by the same logic, but be careful. If you promise not to do certain things that are necessary predicates to your fair use, for example, downloading from a database at large scale, that promise will effectively prevent you from engaging in fair use. The best case scenario is a fair use savings clause 
which is increasingly popular as a strategy for libraries negotiating licenses. These clauses typically say something quite broad like, nothing in this agreement shall bar users from making lawful or fair uses of licensed materials. An agreement with this kind of nothing in this agreement shall language uh, lets you ignore contrary language elsewhere in the agreement as long as your use is otherwise lawful and fair. When a contract is ambiguous, there are several reasons for a court or other interpreter to favor fair use. First, fair uses are right with constitutional underpinnings. Waiver of such rights is generally disfavored and must be typically clear and unambiguous in order to operate. Second, contracts, especially non-negotiated ones, are typically interpreted against the author of the contract. This is, a, this is because these contracts place so much power in the hands of the drafter. Courts are wary of permitting drafters to use ambiguity to their advantage. Instead, they force contract drafters to be as clear as possible to place their counterparties on notice of what the terms are, or else risk losing any dispute over the meaning of ambiguous terms. Remedies for breach of contract are typically much less severe than the toughest copyright penalties. Licenses present a mix of copyright and contract issues, and violating a license can trigger copyright liability. But remember, failing to abide by a license is not copyright infringement unless your use requires permission. In other words, if your use is a fair use, then breaching a contract is only a breach of contract and nothing more. The most likely negative outcome in this case is one the licensor can impose unilaterally on you or your institution, namely cutting off access to the resource. Licensors don't have to go to a court to enforce the terms privately in this way. And because some TDM research can resemble a serious security breach, vendors may be more likely to quickly shut down access, uh, for example, in response to unexpected high levels of traffic. If your institution disagrees with the vendor, they could threaten to sue the vendor and get access restored, but that's an expensive proposition. The more likely outcome is that you and your institution will have to negotiate with the vendor and have access restored on terms that you both agree to. One last substantive issue to consider, especially if you're scraping websites, is trespass to chattels. Trespass may be more familiar in the context of land, but trespass to chattels is just unreasonable interference with the ordinary use of someone's personal property, in this case, an internet server. A paradigm case of trespass to chattels online is a DDoS attack, which barrages a server with so many inquiries that it becomes unusable for its ordinary purpose. Automated scraping or web harvesting activity could trigger a trespass to chattels claim if it took place in a time or manner that interfered with the vendor's ordinary use of the server. Event promoters like Ticketmaster have brought successful trespass to chattels claims uh, against scalpers who would attack their servers hard with robots trying to buy up all the good tickets. The best way to avoid this kind of claim is to be polite when you scrape. Don't hit servers hard, especially during normal business hours. Finally, how can you lower the likelihood of something going wrong? And how can you lower the stakes and reduce the impact in case something does go wrong? One thing to consider is reaching out to the copyright holder or licensor and getting additional or more specific permissions. Experiences can diverge wildly, but generally, vendors are increasingly familiar with TDM research and may be amenable to negotiating specific terms to permit it, even if their standard license does not. As you may have heard in the copyright session, being told no doesn't undermine a fair use argument and may even help you. Another way of controlling risk is to be polite in your use of licensed resources. As I just mentioned, a lot of goodwill can be won by scraping, downloading, or otherwise accessing content in ways that do not interfere with their ordinary use. Ill will and risk, however, go up quickly when your TDM activity looks like a security breach or causes disruptions in service. Finally, be available and responsive when folks have concerns. If you share your data, include a way to be in touch with you. If someone reaches out, don't ignore them. Do what you can to make it easy to channel objections or concerns into a low impact resolution uh, rather than a nastier, more escalated situation.